The second speaker is Professor Ping Jiang. Ping Jiang received his PhD degree in comparative philosophy from Tel Aviv University in 2000. Six years after he arrived to Israel, Professor Jiang is currently Associate Professor of Chinese and East Asian Studies at the Department of East Asian Studies, Tel Aviv University. Professor Jiang's research interests are intertraditional dialogue between Chinese and Jewish traditions. One of his current projects is the study of the translation of the Mishnah into Chinese. His talk, his title is Towards Universal Text, Seder Zraim of the Mishnah in Chinese. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this conference, and uh, thank you for introducing me. Uh, so before I start to, to uh, give my presentation, I would like to say several words about the project. And uh, uh, you can see the uh, cover of the, uh, uh, fourth, the fourth volume of uh, the Mishnah in Chinese. And I uh, bring also here a copy of the book, so you can see the book as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. This is uh, the Seder Zrayim, the fourth volume of the sixth of Mishnah in Chinese. I uh, yeah. Just want to show you uh, how this book is received in China. And you'll see it's, uh, this picture I took from a, a Chinese young man's blog. And uh, it's in late 2011, I think four or five months after the book was published. And he, 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 he bought this book from the internet and he got this book, he was so happy. And he took this picture and he put it in his blog. Uh, and uh, here is... Uh, it's from the uh, Chinese uh, newspaper. It's called Beijing Wanbao, Beijing Evening News. It's uh, one of the uh, most popular Chinese newspaper. Uh, they sell tens of millions of copies each year, uh, every day. And uh, this is their uh, uh, book news page. And they put the uh, news about publication of the Mishnah, said as Ryan, in the first place, actually. And make the introduction. Uh, Uh, there has been an enthusiasm about uh, Judaism, or so-called uh, Jewish wisdom in China. If you go to China, uh, you uh, you go, go to have a look at the bookstores in the, uh, on the street, and you will see a lot of, lot of books uh, about Jewish wisdom. Uh, the archetype of Jewish people in China is basically they are rich and they are wise. And they got their fortunes through their wisdom. So everybody wants to learn that wisdom so, so, that, so that they can be rich someday. So uh, there are so many books in China, and most of them are, are, are completely garbage, because uh, they, these are the books, what we call the faked book. The, 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 the book was faked, because, uh, the, the book was faked, the author was faked, and the, 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 the content of the book was faked, because what, those who composed this book or compiled this book, they knew nothing about the subject. You can see a book uh, uh, printed beautifully and has a name, the Chinese name of Talmud on it. And, and, you, and you open it, it has nothing to do with Talmud at all. Uh, <laughs> this is the, basically the reality today in China. Uh, so I started translating the uh, uh, rabbinic, uh, rabbinic uh, classics into Chinese from 1990s. I, I, the, my first project was uh, together with uh, Rabbi Adin Stanzas, uh, translate, tra translating the Pirkei Avot into Chinese, he wrote uh, uh, connotations for, for special, especially for the Chinese version, and I translated everything. And uh, uh, that was the first rabbinic classics that I ever translated in, in, into Chinese world. Before that, before 1990s, also in 1990s, if you go to China, you go to Taiwan, any, anywhere Chinese world. Uh, when they talk about uh, Jewish people, Jewish culture, Jewish tradition, they talk about the Bible, and the Bible basically they know from the Christian world, and then they jump directly to, to, the, to, to the modern era. They talk about uh, Karl Marx, they talk about, about Einstein, 
and, uh, and they simply ignore the, 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 the whole period before, be, between the Bible and, and, and the modern time. Uh, so in, 1990, in 1996, the Pure Care was published in China, and, and that was the, fir the, fir the first time that Chinese people, anyone in Chinese world, they can read something uh, from the rabbinic tradition. And then in 2003, I published uh, my second translation, uh, Der Herz Zuta. I then from uh, 2005, 2006, I started to think about a more serious pro project. Uh, so I decided to translate the Mishnah into Chinese. Uh, I did it for two reasons. One, I want uh, that there, were, there is a meeting between Chinese tradition and the rabbinic tradition, and I want the meeting happens now. And uh, I want a dialogue, inter-traditional dialogue between Chinese tradition and Jewish tradition, and I want the dialogue happens now. So since nobody else is doing this job, can do this job, so I have to do it myself. Uh, so I started it. I, it took me five years to finish the Seder Zerayim, and uh, the, my plan was every, every three years, one, one side there, so that I can finish it in some, in, in some 20 years. Uh, the, second, uh, uh, the, the second side there, the second moed, is already late, because I, I was supposed to, 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 to give the manuscript this year, by the end of this year, now I see I can give, I can, I can, I can give it only by the end of next year. Uh, but anyway, it's, uh, the project is going on, and uh, I hope I can finish it. And, uh, the sec and this is for second reason I do this job. I want to lay a solid foundation for the coming generations of, of Chinese scholars to translate the two Talmuds into Chinese. And then a uh, serious dialogue between the traditions can happen. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk today in my presentation is about the, my uh, idea that I derived from the uh, rabbinic tradition the, called the universal text. Uh, so uh, my question was that uh, uh, when I started to translate Mishnah, I, I, I asked myself, was Torah the text from the omnipresent? In all, in all of the uh, human languages from the very be beginning. If it was, what was the relationship between the different language versions? And the rabbinic tradition seems like to say that the Torah was given in all human languages. According to Tosefta, the written Torah was translated almost immediately after it was given into 70 languages, which means all the human languages in rabbinic tradition. And here I give the quotation from the uh, Tosefta uh, Rabbi Yoda says, they inscribed the Torah on the stones of the altar. Uh, they said to him, if so, how would the nations of the world learn the Torah? He said to them, this teaches that the omnipresent moved every nation and kingdom to send their scraps, and they translated what was written on the stones into 70 languages, uh, which means old languages. At that moment, the verdict against the nations of, of the world was sealed for destruction. Now this is for the written Torah. As for the oral Torah, it seems that even the translation was not necessary. According to the Babylonian Talmud, every word that omnipotent altered was played immediately into 70 languages immediately. I, I don't have this. The, the passage from Talmud uh, here on, on, the present, on the PPT, so I just read it. Uh, Rabbi Yohanan said, what is meant by the words, the Lord gives the word, they that publish the tidings are a uh, great host. Every single word that went forth from the omnipotent was split up into 70 languages. The school of Rabbi Ishmael taught and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces, just as a hammer is divided into many sparks, so every single word that went forth from the Holy One, blessed be he, split into 70 languages. This is from the Shabbat, eight, uh, page 88b. 88B. The differences between the 70 languages are enormous. The Torah in 70 languages shares two characteristics from spatial and the time point of view. 
first, from spatial point of view, the words of Torah passes any spatial border in this world, even the language differences cannot be the barriers. Although expressed in very different, in, very, in every different language, they are all considered as the words of God, and there's no difference in their identicalness to the original version. The rule of the lost in translation simply does not apply here. The written Torah, even though it was translated by human efforts, the translation was motivated by God and was authorized by him in the way of final judgment. If no nation can ever excuse itself by stating that Torah could not be understood in its language, the translated text must have been as good as the original one. And no misunderstanding due to the language differences was possible. In the case of, in the case of oral Torah, it was believed that no human translation was involved. The words that came from the omnipotent spread by themselves into 70 languages, just like the sparks of a hammer, when it hits a rock, those words are one voice in 70 languages. Secondly, from the time point of view, the words of Torah do not change through any, historic, uh, any historical periods, as they are the words of the God, yet it could be understood by every generation in the exactly same way. Therefore, the Torah in any language can serve as the basis for the heavenly judgment for all nations and all their generations. Such a text can be named a universal text. Derived from the above-mentioned text of rabbinic tradition, universal text is a text composed by a single writer in all the human languages and for all times. It is a text beyond time and space a text that not only can be understood anywhere in any language in the same sense, but also can be understood by people in different historical periods. For a text without, with, with universal contents, universal text is the ideal form of its existence. Given the vast differences between the human language and the content, constant change of any specific language, universal text lo looks like a text in its perfection, a far away dream that can come true only with miracles of God. Nevertheless, I still would like to ask if we, in spite of all the limits of our ability as human beings, could make meaningful breakthroughs in our way towards the dream, towards that dream. If we can, how do we do that? A question that I always ask myself when I translate the Mishnah is, if a Chinese Torah has been existed from the moment that Torah was given and has been in the hand of God, what is that Torah like? If the answer is, is the universal text as we defined above, then what blocks the way from my text towards that text and what could be done about it? So I believe a universal text translation of the Mishnah should have two basic qualities. First, it should echo the tongues of Hebrew language, give readers the feeling of the original language by choosing, by choosing proper words and by maintaining as much as possible the original sentence structure of Hebrew language. Secondly, it should take its roots deep in Chinese tradition and should be composed of stable elements of the language and it's understandable all the time, at least until now. In order to reach that three-way cross point of Hebrew, classic Chinese, classical Chinese, and modern Mandarin, uh, there are at least three problems that we have to deal with. The first problem comes from the fundamental differences between Hebrew and Chinese languages. Uh, it is almost impossible to write modern Chinese text in the sentence structures of Mishnah Hebrew without hurting the fluency and the clearance of the text. The second problem comes from the openness of the Mishnah, Mishnah text. Mishnah texts are open to exegesis because of its so-called nature of professionalism. The texts are so concise that ordinary readers might feel the un unavoidable ambiguity due to the fact that the writers or compilers were addressing to experts of the halakha and therefore did not bother explaining any special, special terms. Such openness 
left enough space for Talmudic exegesis, and therefore was one of the key, key elements of the develop, for the development of rabbinic Judaism. Therefore, the Mishnah translated without openness is not the Mishnah anymore. While translating the text with the tones of Hebrew is difficult enough, translating the ambiguity of the text looks almost impossible. The third problem comes from the nature of the text. Since the text is a holy scripture, the beauty of the language, as well as certain signs of holiness, must be kept in the Chinese translation. With the damage on the style of the Chinese translation by the force of keeping the tones and the ambiguity of the original text, how to produce a translation with the beauty of Chinese language became a major challenge of the work. Uh, with those problems in mind, and inspired by, the, by some biblical translation, practi translation practices, such as King James, King James Bible version and the German, the German version by Martin Bubo and Franz Rosenzweig, which in, contract, in contrast to many colloquial translations, stress the classical style of the language and try to resonate the tones of the original Hebrew, uh, Holy Scripture, are applied to two strategies. First, I try to create a new Chinese language style that combines classical Chinese, modern Mandarin, and the structure of the Hebrew language in my translation of the Mishnah. The usage of classical Chinese in the translation contributed to success in three ways. First, it gives the translation both the beauty of the language and the sense of the holiness that is needed. A proper usage of classical Chinese components in modern Mandarin naturally uplifted the level of the vocabulary and colored the language with a tone of classics. Secondly, it makes the introduction of the Jewish uh, Hebrew tongues into Chinese language possible, as classical Chinese is more flexible with the grammatical structure of sentences, it is easier to compose the Chinese text according to Hebrew style. Thirdly, it makes the translation of the openness of the text possible, as classical Chinese by nature has more ambiguity than modern Mandarin, openness of the Hebrew text can be integrated into Chinese translations more smoothly. The second strategy that I use in translation is the connotations. In order to keep the openness of the text, I avoided inserting explaining section into the translation with brackets, which is a main method of, the, of most English translations. With the help of the natural ambiguity of the classical Chinese, the openness of the original text was successful, successfully preserved, while the translation also appears natural to Chinese readers. All the explanations go to connotations, and therefore the Seder Zorayim in Chinese has some 3,500 footnotes. Now I want to show you two examples, just a little bit in Chinese to uh, explain to you how my strategies work. Uh, I have the Chinese translation there. Here, here's the, also the Chinese translation. The, the same, well, same thing, just in traditional Chinese characters. And uh, we have we have in the middle the English translation by Danby, and here is the uh, Hebrew text. And uh, this is a passage from the uh, uh, Brachot seven seven four. Uh, and it's talking about. And uh, this is a passage about the. Uh, uh, seeing the grace or the ben uh, benedicts before and after the meals. You know, if you have three people, then you have to see the, 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 the common grace. And, uh, and you, you, also, you, you also need to invite people form, uh, formally so it make it more official. And if you have 10 people, then you add the, 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 the word Elohim into it. So, uh, so the Mishnah text said, uh, 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 if, you, if you have three, three together, you cannot separate them because otherwise they, they will not say the common grace. Uh, and then the Hebrew text said, said Han alba, han hamisha. And now if we look at the uh, uh, English translation, and he said in, in the uh, red color, he said, so too if there are four or five. Uh, the translation is right, but I think it lost the tone of, of the original Hebrew, Hebrew text. 
uh, it's also the, 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 the beauty of the reputation here, you see the Ken, the Han Arba, Han Hamisha. Uh, in Chinese translation, uh, if, you know, if you can read a little bit Chinese, uh, uh, you can see here I use the classic Chinese, uh, classical Chinese instead of modern Mandarin. Uh, because in modern Mandarin, if, 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 I, if I say the, 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 the sentence as I, 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 I say it is in Hebrew, then it sounds uh, uh, some kind of uh, some kind of uh, 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 redundant. Uh, but in classic Chinese, I, I can say it. I say si ren ru si, wu ren yu si. I repeat the, the hand hand and and uh, and uh, it sounds beautiful uh, in classical Chinese. And also, you can see uh, in the in my Chinese translation, the blue part in English. I put the uh, interpretation, uh, his interpretation in the uh, translation in brackets, and I think this is a very bad uh, habit in English translation that block the openness of the original text. It's like you have to uh, explain the, understand the, 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 the text according to, uh, according to, 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 the, to the interpret. So I didn't put anything, anything there, and I, I, I leave it open, and, the, and I put uh, all the explanation in the footnotes, but what's important is the original, the original text. Although there is the ambiguity, although there, uh, the, the openness is there, the text itself is still beautiful and uh, fluent in, in, in Chinese. Just show you another example. Uh, and this is a, a passage from Pea 3.7. It's about someone was very sick and, and is going to die maybe and he gives uh, uh, and he distributes his, his property to, uh, to, 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 to people uh, take, take heritage from him and he says that uh, if he uh, sends everything but, but he keeps a piece of land uh, for himself then if he recovers then the, all, all, all distribution uh, is notified because uh, uh, it's not valid anymore uh, he, he can keep all, all, all his property, and if he didn't, uh, if he didn't keep the land for himself, then uh, everything's gone. Uh, so the interesting thing I want to show here is the uh, you see that everything written in, uh, in red color. It's kotev, kotev, katav, katav, and also you have uh, he talked here about ketuva, and uh, ketuvata, and, uh, and in, 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 green, in green color. Um, if you look at the in English translation, uh, you can see clearly here and here are poor. Yeah. There's no there's no connection between this uh, from from the uh, from the word itself. And we see in, in, in Hebrew we, we can see tons of uh, of katab, the the the, story, <laughs> the root of the of the word all, all that. Uh, now in Chinese, I. I I choose the words from classical Chinese, so uh, I can use the word shu zheng, which means kotev, and also kotev to give someone as a gift. So I so I don't need to insert the the, the bracket as some is in English as a gift. Uh, this is one thing. The second thing is that uh, it happens in in Ch classical Chinese the the certificate the marriage certificate also comes with the word shu. So it's I call the tongues in Hebrew that you have the uh, you have katab in all these uh, words. It's okay. Uh, the well, well, conclusion. So I think the classical Chinese is the key is the key point here, and use, the use classical Chinese makes text elegant and beautiful, and classical Chinese gives the text more flexibility flexibility to keep the style of the Hebrew, and classical Chinese make the openness of the text in Chinese possible, and in one word I would I would like to say the use the usage of classic Chinese make my translation a step closer, maybe to the what I call the universal text. Thank you.
I tell you the the, the, pro, the yeah the problem between uh, the the different uh, the, the difference between Hebrew text and the Chinese uh, the Hebrew structure and Chinese structure the most problem problematic uh, part uh, modern Mandarin uh, we have to put all the uh, time words and place word before the verb but in Hebrew you. Uh, most of the time, not most of the time, but you can, you can put it before, you can, you can put it after. So in, in, in many translations, in, in many original texts, you, you have the time word and, and the place word after the verb. And uh, with modern, modern, Chinese, modern Mandarin, I cannot uh, give the Chinese translation according to the structure of, of, the, of the Hebrew language. But with classical Chinese, I can do that. And people will feel a little bit strange. It's still, it's still elegant. It's still, it's still natural. But they will, they will feel a little bit strange. But still, this is acceptable. What do you do with the stem inflected in different patterns and make alliteration in Hebrew? Like Hotel Ketuba, Katable. Ah, uh, yeah. Resolutions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I cannot give. Uh, this is. This is something I, I, I cannot uh, do it uh, completely. I mean, I mean with, with, the help, with the assistance of classical Chinese, I can do uh, some of them. I can do, for example, <laughs> if it's the full future tense, I can put one word lifting the, uh, before the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Chinese verb. And, and people will understand this is the, uh, the filter, uh, the future tense. And uh, uh, for the most part, the 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 the, uh, uh, the 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 change form of the verb uh, according to to to, to subject, uh, the, the female, male, things like that. I I cannot do anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for enlightening. Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's, it's a very, very good question. Actually, this is what I'm thinking all, all the time. We have, we have a, a, Buddhism, a Buddhism monk uh, in the 7th century. His name is, is Xuan Zhang. And uh, he traveled to India, and he lived there 30 years uh, in order to study the Sanskrit and, and, and to get all the, all the Buddhism classics. And he came back to China. And he and, 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 and he and he started to translate with his disciples, and his translation was the most imp most important contribution to the uh, Buddhism in China. And Buddhism in China, uh, 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 Buddhism Buddhism had a great influence over Chinese civilization, Chinese culture, I call. And uh, and his translation was important not only for to to, to the Chinese tradition, uh, the the Buddhism part in Chinese tradition also import was important. Uh, to the uh, Buddhism in India because uh, they lost all their uh, uh, a large part of their classics and now they have to translate it back uh, for, from Chinese classics and so I I I, I, I can I should say I, I talked to people also also about this I think it, it was the model that in, inspired me all the time yeah thank you. you you mentioned that what does a reader when he finds your classical Chinese how does he know that it's classical Chinese and not, not modern Mandarin? Now, does he immediately know when he picks up the book? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, he will know it, but when I, but there, uh, there's, a, there's classical Chinese and there's modern Mandarin. And there's, there, are, there, is, there is a certain uh, intersection between the two languages. So the part of the classical Chinese is still living in the modern Mandarin, just, uh, ordinary people they don't use it uh, that much. They they, they, they prefer to, to the colloquial Chinese, the, the spoken language. So what I what I am using in my translation is basically mostly is the this living part of the uh, of the classical Chinese. So when they when they say some, uh, most people people like like the boy holding this uh, book. I I don't think he will tell the difference between the classical Chinese, but he will feel uh, this is. Kind of language very different from uh, from the language that he speaks your uh, day to day life. Yeah. Uh, 